Tom Campbell here. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you and enjoy the video. All right, hello everyone and welcome to the 84th My Big Toe Fireside Chat. My name is Adam Hashin, and as always, I'm excited and honored to be your host for today. If anyone is watching this for the first time, the Fireside Chat is an informal discussion with a focus on practical, general subjects that thousands of people may be helped from. Uh, we still welcome participants to ask any question that you may feel, however personal, but it may be edited for the final YouTube video. Before we get started, I also want to mention that if you wish to support the production of the Fireside Chat and other My Big Toe videos and events, we now have a Patreon to help contribute towards production costs. We've included a link in the description of this video. If you want to instead donate some of your time or skills, there are many projects currently in development that can use your help. You can reach out to MBT Events, QSAC, or even just drop a comment in this video and we can figure out how you can help and become part of the team. And likewise, I'd like to encourage anyone who is here on this discussion to share your personal experiences if you feel they are relevant to the topic being discussed. So everyone here, you're all participants and even though Tom does the majority of the talking and answering, uh, we'd love to hear from everyone. So uh, we have a lot of great questions and a lot of people here today. So we're hopefully we can get through everyone's questions and we like to prioritize those who are here first. So we have a, a, a kind of a simple one to start from, uh, I believe it's from Armin. His question is regarding uh, everyday tools to get rid of fear. How can one optimize the work with reducing fears in a hectic life? So it seems like nowadays everyone's very busy. We have hectic lives. How can we practically reduce our fear while we're going through our daily life? Okay, well, that's a very good question, uh, Armand. Uh, your your growth, your your evolution, your letting go of fear has to be something that you do on a daily basis. It's not something you go out and do, you know, every other weekend or something. It's something that you do every single day. It has to be part of your life. So letting go of your fear should be something that you are engaged in 24-7. Always, you're aware of your fear. You're always aware of how that fear is bending and manipulating your choices. And because you're aware of that, you don't want to be that way. So you have this intent to change it. And that intent will lead you to do the things you need to do to, to actually change it, to get rid of that, that fear. So you should always be working on them. Um, the main tool is just to have a very sincere intent to get rid of them. So I guess partially it would be good to know what is you're getting rid of. So first identifying the fear, accepting that it is your fear, um, you know, having some sense of what that fear is and what it's doing to you would all be helpful. And you can do that while in a meditation state or you can you can do that just by looking at your behavior. You know, when do you have negative feelings? Whenever you have a negative feeling, that's because you have a fear. That negative feeling usually comes from ego or belief that is a part that is created by the fear. So whenever you have something that's negative in your life, then there's a fear attached somewhere. Well, what is that fear? And you know, how is it affecting you? Spend some time with that. 
And then once you spend some time with it to where you know that fear, you're aware of that fear, you feel that fear, then you can start getting rid of it, having the intent not to make your choices because of it. Have your intention to, you know, to let it go, to not let it uh, interfere with your life. And when you have that intention, you will automatically do those things that get rid of it. So it's, it's a matter of being aware of your fear, kind of spending some time with that fear, trying to see, you know, why do I get angry? Why do I get upset? Why do I feel abused? Why do I feel, um, you know, uh, not satisfied? Why do I feel small and, and, and uh, inadequate? Why do I feel whatever? All of those things that, that are negative. And you have, to, you have to work a little on answering that question, why? Where does it come from? How does it affect my choices? That's getting to know your fear. Then you can get rid of it. If you never get to know your fear, it's just this amorphous thing that is kind of hard to get rid of because it doesn't have a shape or a form or a, or a, you know, it doesn't have any substance. It's hard to get rid of smoke. You know, it's much easier to get rid of something that you know is there it is. So identify it first. Then have an intent to let it go and eventually you'll succeed and it will, it will go. So I guess the first part of the process is to see your fear, to get to know it, to explore it, to explore how it affects your choices, where you know what it is and what it's about. You don't necessarily will know where it comes from or why you have it. And you don't really have to know that. Sometimes for some people, it's helpful to know that and they go back to the source and deal with that source. But that's not necessary. You don't have to do it that way. That can be a quick way of dealing with it. But not everybody, you know, will will be able to do that, connect at the source. Sometimes the source is very, you know, hard to put a finger on. It's lots of sources. It's experiences through decades of life that have given you that fear. And it doesn't turn out to be a particular thing that caused it. So you may not find that that root source as a, as a single thing, but that's not the point. The point is to understand the fear and then to have a serious being level intent to get rid of it. And then you just keep that up, keep doing it all the time, day-to-day life day and night, an awareness of the fear comes first, intent then comes second. Tom, that's one of the biggest things, right? That persistence, that every day keeping it in your head. That's the key. That's the key. Otherwise, if you're trying to get rid of the fear because you think you should, or just because you'd like your life to be better, that can be just your intellect talking. Your intellect. Your intellect says, oh, I'd like to get rid of that fear. But your intellect doesn't have much power to do anything about it. Your intellect's kind of along for the ride, you know, as far as what's at your being level. So if it stays in your intellect that every once in a while you say, oh, yeah, I get angry about that. I should stop that. Well, it probably is not going to get rid of your fear. That's not the way you get rid of fear. So the intellect isn't it. That's why it takes every day, as you say, Adam, you know, every minute of every day, you constantly have to have that in the back of your mind because you have to change who you are at the being level. It's not just something that you can do with your intellect. You have to change at the being level. And changing at the being level is something that takes persistence and it takes time. It's not a quick, it's not a quick thing. Now, people can very quickly, if they have strong personalities, say, oh, well, I just won't do that anymore. I just won't think that anymore. And then they suppress it. And whenever it comes up, they shove it under the rug and suppress it. That's not getting rid of fear. All that does is is make it worse in the long term. Eventually, there'll be so much stuff under that rug that you won't be able to walk on it anymore. It'll start to interfere with your life. It'll start to bubble out as you get older. 
that's uh, one of the things that happens as you as you mature and grow older is that stuff that you stuffed under the rug starts to come back out. You can't suppress it forever. So, Tom, this actually ties into one of Ash's questions is that that fear really goes away, right? It's not that you're feeling it and kind of uh, acting through it and just kind of ignoring it and brushing it off. It's really just gone, right? What you're trying to do is get rid of it. Absolutely. 100% completely get rid of it. Yes, I, I read through the questions today. I happened to have some little extra time. So I did look through them and I saw the one from uh, from Ash. What is it? Ash O. And uh, indeed, we are trying to get rid of it. We're not just trying to push our way through it. We're not trying to uh, kind of force our way through the fear. Oh, here's this thing. I don't like it. This upsets me. This makes me angry. But I'll just smile and get through it and grit my teeth and we'll get through it. That's not the point. That's the intellect. That's the intellect at work. The intellect is trying to modify behavior. But we're not trying to modify behavior in growing up. We're trying to modify who we are. So in order to modify who we are, you have to get rid of it. So, yes, that's a that's a very... Uh, significant difference if it's uh, it's left to the intellect then you will either struggle and fight with it forever or you'll stuff it under a rug where you don't have to deal with it and those are kind of your two choices with your intellect but neither one will help you get rid of it and just stuffing it under the rug is usually counterproductive it would be even more productive just to express it, then at least you're being honest and you're being straightforward, you're being real. That would be better than pushing it under the rug and pretending that it's not there. That's probably the worst case. What do you think, Armand? you have any follow-up questions? Did that answer what you're looking for? Yeah, very good answers. I'm just thinking of everyday life and, and like when you keep it in the back of your mind that you don't want to be uh, that way it's so easy to like have it in in the intellectual side when when things happen at work and and you and i can almost feel like yeah that was the wrong thing to do in that conversation but then it's gone and do you have any tool uh, tools that could be useful to kind of collect uh, everyday life happenings and uh, uh, getting power in, into the fear-reducing uh, work? Yeah, just two things, Armand, and one is being aware. Being aware of your choices, being aware of your feelings, being aware of, of your behavior, just being aware of who you are. Don't go through life as a zombie. So being aware, like you say, sometimes you're at work and you say, oh, I probably shouldn't have done that. All right, be aware of that then don't just let it go. Once you're aware of it, you have to do some, some uh, kind of self-analysis, some soul searching, some introspection. So it would be good, yes, if you meditate daily, then say your last meditation of the day, you ought to go through all those things, all the things that day that probably weren't such good choices. All those things during the day that gave you some kind of negative feeling and deal with them and see maybe how you could have done that better. Think about that fear, you know, try to, try to let go of it. More effort you put into letting go of it, the more likely you are to let go of it quicker. If you put just a little effort in, it might take years. If you put a lot of effort in, it maybe only take months. So yes, every time you have some still time by yourself, a little, and it doesn't have to be formal meditation. You can just, you know, be introspective. Think about it. See how you could have done it better. Make a, you know, a, a kind of a promise to yourself that you will do it better next time. You'll think first before you talk. And that, so that's how you just keep at it. Sure. 
If you just say, oh, yeah, I didn't do so well, and then you forget about it, and the next time, oh, it didn't do so well there either, and then you forget about it, well, you're not really making much progress doing that. You have to be aware of what you're doing and try to do better. Thank you. All right, what do you say, Tom? Let's move along. Sure, let's move along. Okay, we're going now towards uh, NPMR, non-physical uh, matter reality mechanics. This question is from Nathan, and he wants to know how these relative time works in different reality frames. For instance, he says, <clears throat> could it be useful to spend one hour in another reality doing good, whether it's healing or connecting with others, communicating, um, doing that for an hour, and then it only is 10 minutes that has passed in this reality. And if you're grown up, can you create your own frames with different time clocks so that you can almost use this as a trusty tool? Well, you can always create your own, your own frame. You know, you can always, uh, you can always do that. So yes, time is something that comes from your own perspective. How much time has passed depends on how much change you've seen take place. You know, if we're in a, it's just like motion. You know, if you're in a place that, where, there, where there is no background, then you can't tell whether you're moving or not, because the only way we discern whether we're moving is to see if the background changes relative to us. So if you get rid of the background, then you no longer can tell whether you're moving or still. With time, if you get into a place where you are very focused, very your attention is very focused on something, and if that something doesn't have a lot of change in it, Maybe you're just in point consciousness state where there's very little change, nothing going on. Then time will seem to stand still. You can be in there what seems like a long time and come back and only five or 10 minutes have gone by. And you can hardly believe it. So time has to do with our perception of change, of things that are going on, of what's happening. So that's one factor, just one factor. There's another factor, and that is when you are in mind space, when you're within consciousness, the speed that things take place in consciousness is much, much faster than the speed that things take place here in this physical reality. Consciousness goes at the speed of the, you know, what, the speed of your consciousness. You know, it's a much faster thing than the speed of your body or the, the speed of the physical reality. So if you get into consciousness, you can do lots and lots of things, process lots of information, and you can do it in very, very little clock time as far as here in the physical reality, just because you're working at the speed of consciousness, not at the speed of this, this avatar. You know, this avatar is what an electrochemical, uh, uh, you know, mechanical system. And relative to consciousness, it's slow. You know, it's really, really slow. So that's another thing that, that, that centers on time. But in our physical reality, in this virtual reality, there is a, there is a clock, the delta T, and it just keeps on ticking, and things just keep on marching by. If you have your focus on change, and a lot of things are changing, then you're aware of that time because you see change. If you're in mind space and things aren't happening or they're happening at the speed of mind rather than, than the speed of uh, you know, physical reality, then it seems that you can get a whole lot done in a very short amount of physical time. So it's, it's not like you can set up a special place where time is slow and then you can go there and work. You could do that, but basically what you're doing is you're setting up, say, a room. Okay, I go into my slow time room. Well, if you're in a room and there's nothing else in there, it's just you and white walls and they never change. Well, now everything that changes is going to be what's changing in your mind. Now you're at the speed of consciousness 
and things can go really, really fast relative to what's going on uh, in the physical world. So, yes, all of those things, you know, kind of impinge on our sense of time passage. But just looking at the, our physical virtual reality, that time just chugs along every delta T, and that always happens. Now, if you're really busy in the physical reality, you know, you're really working an interesting problem, and that problem really has you focused, well, hours can go by and you hardly even notice. You know, you're solving some really great problem and you're very into it, and you can look up and realize that, you know, three or four hours have gone by and you hardly noticed at all. Or if you're having a lot of fun, you're just enjoying yourself. Everything is just perfect, you know. Well, you know, that can, you know, that can seem like it was a really long time because you were focused. You weren't looking at change. You were just looking at the feelings. And the feelings took more time. And you may miss time there, too. You may suddenly kind of snap out of it and realize that 20 minutes have gone by. And you thought only a few minutes had gone by. And vice versa, if you're really, really bored, if you're doing something very, very boring, repetitious, you know, you're counting grains of rice, you know, on your table or something like that, you're licking envelopes for Christmas, Christmas cards or something, you know, if you're doing something like that, you could be doing it for an hour and it seems like you've been doing it all day. Then time goes the other way. So time has a lot to do with our perspective. I mean, yes, there is a, a clock and it is ticking in this physical reality, but whether it seems to go fast or slow has to do with our perception of what's going on. And yes, okay, those envelopes you're looking, you know, they're going on and it's one after another and that's changed. But at the same time, it's just sameness. There's no, you know, there's nothing interesting about it. So it, it becomes a drag. And even a half an hour of doing that seems like way too long. You just have to push yourself to keep going until you get through the pile. Well, then it seems very, very slow. You know, that's, uh, that's perception. So time's kind of a fluid thing for us, for we consciousness. It depends a whole lot about our perception at the time and, way, and what we think about what it is we're doing. What do you think, Nathan? Do you have any follow-ups for, for that? That was super informative. Thank you, Tom, because not only did you explain the mechanics and the perception aspects, but my takeaway, too, if I'm hearing right, is just keep growing up, and the maximal efficiency of time will just sort of happen spontaneously as I grow up, as we all grow up, because a tool like creating a room and going in there, all that will be, if anything, just getting in the way, just letting letting the growth then optimize somehow spontaneously our time because my whole intent was like oh, i want to want to be able to really squeeze the juice out of time you know how do i really uh -huh. get the most bang for buck here and and so it sounds like that'll just happen when we grow up absolutely it just happens make the best choices you can as you go stay present in the moment don't live as a zombie and uh, time will take care of itself Efficiency of process will also take care of itself. All right, let's. Uh, we're going to keep on this um, topic of NPMR mechanics, and this next question is from Scott C. And it's basically about the psi uncertainty principle and the miraculous. You know, all there's been many stories through time of yogis doing miraculous feats. Um, staying alive for a long time, uh, much longer than humans are supposed to. I mean, we've heard stories all throughout time of these miracles and bending the rules. And he's wondering what, what's really going on there? Are you really able to bend the rules? Could these, could there be a uh, truth to these stories of Moses parting the sea and um, all kinds of fantastic stories that we've read about in the past? You know, is there any, truth to these stories if there was 
perhaps a less active psi uncertainty principle during that time? Well, there could be, you know, or they could be metaphors, you know, or it, it could be either way. You know, if we look at history so far back that we don't have any people around who were there as, you know, as firsthand witnesses, then it could be metaphoric or it could have actually happened because uh, rules can be broken. They're not broken all the time or they wouldn't be rules. <laughs> uh, what makes them a rule is that they have to be followed. That kind of defines the rule. But you can. Uh, break rules, you know, and we're talking about rules in the rule set. So that's what defines the physical reality. So we're talking about the physical reality. Now, in a way, you're breaking rules of the physical reality just by doing things that don't have anything to do with the physical reality. They only have to do with consciousness. So when you remote view, in a way, you're breaking the rules in that you're getting information that there's no physical way you could have gotten it. You come up with information that is not has never been physically available to you. So in a way, you're going around the rule there <laughs> more, I guess, than breaking it, you know, rather than saying you can only know those things that you have physically interacted with, then consciousness can slip right around that rule and know things that you've never been physically uh, connected to. So that's that's one thing, but you're also talking about breaking the the rule set rules, the rules of this physical reality. So you do things that that uh, shouldn't be able to be done physically. Well, you know, we see people who put a put a little uh, piece of paper on a and put a pin through it so that it's you know it's it's easy to turn. And then sometimes they'll put a glass jar over it so that you can't have air blowing it around. And then they'll use their intent to make it spin. Have you ever seen those? You can you can see those little experiments uh, on YouTube pretty easily if you if you look for uh, uh, what would you look for um, psychokinesis, I guess, or telekinesis. Okay, and they're not too hard to do. You can do those sorts of experiments. So in a way, that's breaking the rule set. The thing should just sit there. It shouldn't spin. Well, how does it spin? Well, the reason it spins is because your, your consciousness, and you can modify future probability with your intent, and inside under that little glass jar that's over top that, that, that thing that can spin easily, there is air in there. And the air isn't just always perfectly uniform. It's mostly uniform, but that's a statistical process. There's little tiny pockets of non-uniformity floating around in there all the time. There's uncertainty as to what the pressure is at any point. So if you had a measuring device that could measure the pressure in every square millimeter or every square hundredth of a millimeter inside that jar, you'd find that there's differences in pressure all over the place coming and going, appearing, disappearing. In other words, it's a statistical process. Well, with your intent, you can modify future probability. So what you can do is just create a little more pressure, air pressure on one side of that piece of paper and less on the other side. And sure enough, that paper will start to spin around because you're manipulating air pressure under the glass with your intent because intent can manipulate where there is uncertainty and all of those little fluctuations in pressure are all statistical. They all have a lot of uncertainty with them. So that's how you can do that. Now you take an, a pump and you pump all the air out from under that glass. So there isn't any air in there. Now it's a lot harder. You can't, you can't play that trick anymore. The only trick you'd have to play there is manipulate any physical vibrations that would be going on in the room, any uncertainty in physical vibrations, and that's a lot harder to come by. So now you've got a more difficult thing to do, but certainly by the, by the rules, you shouldn't be able to modify air pressure inside a glass with your intent, just like you shouldn't be able to heal somebody with your mind. But I think besides those things, which all kind of break the rule set, 
you're talking about dramatic things like living to be, you know, 500 years old or uh, floating up in the air because you are, uh, you know, nullifying gravity somehow or teleporting from one physical place to another. Those kinds of dramatic uh, breaking of the rule sets. Well, those sort of dramatic things, of course, come into conflict with the uncertainty principle a little more than the more subtle and more subtle and smaller things do. So they're a lot less frequent. And to answer the question, how would you, you know, how would one learn how to do those things? First of all, do those things exist? Has anybody ever done something like that? Some kind of dramatic modification of the rule set? And the answer to that is, of course. Of course. In a virtual reality, anything that can happen usually does. Now, it may not happen a lot. It may be exceedingly rare, but anything can happen in a virtual reality. Okay. Now, let's say you want to have two bodies. You want to have one body here being you, and at the same time, you'd like to be visiting your cousin in Japan. So here you are, you know, at the fireside chat, having a chat, but you'd also like to be visiting your, your friend in Japan with a body. You know, you have a body two places. Well, could you do that? Well, how would you do that? First, you'd have to have a really good relationship with the LCS because the LCS would have to put data in the data stream to your friend in Japan that made you a physical being there. So it's not something you're going to do on your own. It's not something you're just going to say, oh, I'll just split in half and one of them will appear over in Japan because this is a virtual reality and you'd have to get the system to render you, put you in the data stream there. If the system doesn't want to play, you can't do it. If the system does want to play, it's not all that hard, you see? So what would be the requirements to get that done? Well, first, you'd have to have a very good relationship, a good working relationship with the LCS. How would you get that? By growing up, by getting rid of your fear, by being a very low entropy individual. Now you and the LCS would probably be on everyday terms, probably interact a lot. Maybe it would, if it thought that it was somehow for the benefit of people's growth, it may just put somebody else in a data stream or put you in that data stream two or three times. Why would it do that? I don't know. Maybe there's some way that would lower entropy. Maybe it would just, if it got reported and you had, you, you know, you had your friend there with a, with a camera talking to you and you were here talking on this thing all at the same time and you took that and made those two movies together and they had time stamps on the film and you showed people and said, look at this, look what I can do. Well, that might open a lot of minds, but not too many because most people would say, ah, nonsense. You know, anybody could put anything, you know, in film. You know, I've seen pigs fly in films, you know, that's uh, anything could happen. They could, they could change those time stamps or do whatever. It doesn't mean a thing. So most people wouldn't be, uh, wouldn't be uh, uh, willing to believe that it was true. So the psi uncertainty principle probably wouldn't be a big problem because most people would blow it off anyway. So maybe you could do that, but you first have to have a good working relationship, which means you'd have to be a very low entropy being to do that. Now, what about uh, um, you know, levitating? Well, if you wanted to work on that so that, uh, you know, that was something you wanted to do, that doesn't require the LCS really to necessarily do that. Well, it would have to cooperate with you because it would have to put that in the data stream that you were levitated and there wasn't anything holding you up. But uh, that would be a simpler thing to do. You'd have to also be a very low entropy being so that you could put that much intent over modifying future probability so that maybe all that, that same little air that was moving that paper around under that, that glass, you know, that, that glass uh, cover, maybe it would be all that, that 
air would change and you'd have a higher pressure behind under you and lower pressure above you. And maybe you'd just be floating up there in a pressure differential that you created with your intent, you know, in the same way, perhaps. So you see, there's lots of ways that we can perhaps do things that are breaking the rule set, but it requires a very well-developed intuitive side and a very low entropy to do things like that. Your mind would have to be very focused. You, you would have to have a very strong, powerful intent without any noise, with, with utmost clarity. And again, if you were just trying to impress your friends, it probably wouldn't work because that would be an ego thing. And if you had that much ego, well, your entropy probably wouldn't be low enough to do it. And if your entropy was low enough to do it, you probably really would care to do it. It wouldn't be anything that you really would feel would be significant. So you would never do it. Unless, of course, you just wanted to prove to yourself that you could. And that's mainly the way we we hear about these strange things. Somebody does it just to prove to themselves that they can. And maybe they show a couple of friends or whatever just to demonstrate that it's possible. And then that's it, because there's really not a lot of point in it. You see, unless you have a really big ego and, you know, you want to you know, show off, but then you wouldn't be able to do it in the first place. So that's why we have these little glimpses into these miracle kind of things that break the rule set, but then they sort of disappear and they're not, you know, it's not that somebody, uh, you know, does something really, really dramatic, you know, when all the news cameras are running, you know, that doesn't really happen because that takes a pretty big ego to want to do that. You know, it's not really going to help people grow up any, even if you get, you know, a million people to go, oh, wow, gee whiz, look at that. That's not going to help them grow up. They're just going to say, wow, reality's strange, and maybe that's a good step forward, but it's not that big a deal. So that's why these things just seem to happen occasionally with certain people sometimes, and then they just disappear, because the people that might be able to do that really aren't interested unless it's just for themselves, and then they're not interested really in showing it off or demonstrating, because that's all ego-based. But yes, it's possible. So, Tom, it sounds like I won't be able to send a copy of myself to work anytime soon, right? <laughs> or, you know, 10 copies of yourself, all the different jobs, and then uh, bring, bring in 10, <laughs> 10 salaries, yes. Perfect. I like the way you're thinking. Uh, <laughs> Peter, you had a follow-up question about modifying future probability. I think this is a perfect time to ask about it. Yes, it's uh, funny how that happens. Um, hey, Tom, good to see you. Good to see you, Peter. And the question really, I'm sorry, I've got my dog gone down. Good boy. Uh, the question is, when we're talking about modifying future probability using a really focused intent, and we're operating out of inanimate um, objects where the rule set can be subject to statistical probability, like the airflow experiment, for example. Mm -hmm. When we use intent to look at outcomes, a lot of people focusing on visualization of, of goals, dreams, desires, that kind of thing. And a lot of the way that they manifest in some ways has to do with other people, other players in the game, having played certain roles or mm -hmm. interact. My point being, when you bring in something outside of an inanimate rule set and you start bringing in people that then are subject to free will who seem to have played a role in supporting that, is it down to them being kind of freewheeling and therefore being um, subject to a, a higher level of coherence that you're broadcasting? If they're kind of in the, the default film extra role in your movie, uh, uh, or how, how would that work? Or is there a little bit more depth if I'm explaining that right? Yeah, no, it does work. You do uh, affect other people. You know, if you have, let's say, like uh, my friend Dennis Menerick, uh, he would he would always uh, create a parking place for himself. Uh, and we worked in a building that was just downtown, which means there was no place to park. And he would be very successful that when he got there, 
just as he got there, somebody would back the car out because if they backed it out 30 seconds earlier, somebody else that was cruising around looking for a parking place would get it. So he got to where he was about 80 to 90 percent effective in having a parking place for him when he needed one. So, of course, that had to affect other people. So what he was doing was changing the probabilities of the way things work. So we talk about uncertainty, right? The reason that the airflow thing worked was because there's uncertainty in, you know, the pressure in that air at the small, at a small level. Okay. Well, there's uncertainty in what people might do. There's lots of uncertainty there. So there's somebody who's in one of those office buildings downtown there, and they're thinking that, uh, they should, uh, they, they need to leave now and go home because they're expecting you know, somebody to visit. So they, they need to go home. Now, whether they go home right then, 10 seconds later, or a minute later, eh, that's pretty random. You know, it could go any of those ways. So if Dennis has this, this, uh, this intention that a parking space show up just as he gets there, well, these are all the uncertainties. There's lots of things in motion, lots of people, lots of parking, and lots of people needing to go and, and other people coming, looking for places. And in all that uncertainty, what he's done is he's changed the probability that all of it will just work out such that when he gets there, there'll be a parking space. So it does affect the choices that other people make. So his intention may make somebody say, Oh, gee, I didn't know it was this late. I better run out and get in my car and, and go home. And just as they do, is when Dennis pulls up. So the system, the probabilities change. And as those probabilities change, it affects the whole system around you. You know, if, when, you, when you think, when you use your intention, it's not just a, you know, a precise line that just affects that thing. If there's multiple things at play, it affects everybody. And people have nudges. You might call them nudges, but it's not so much that somebody's giving them a nudge. Oh, you, you need to go home now, that the system's out there giving people nudges to help Dennis get a parking spot. It doesn't work like that. But it's just that the probabilities change in such a way that Dennis will get that spot. And those probability changes are just, all over. So people will will feel, I guess, that gradient. Maybe you think it that way. There's a there's kind of a gradient that makes up a person's mind, whether it's time to leave and go get in their car. And that gradient, if it's a little steeper, they'll go there a little sooner. That gradient is a little flatter, they may be dally around and you know do something else. So Dennis's intent changes those gradients a little bit. Doesn't force people to do anything. They can do whatever they please. They have free will. They don't have to do anything. But in as much as they're kind of on automatic, just kind of doing what feels right, then that could, you know, that gradient's now a little steeper and it's time just so they'll get to the car and pull out just as Dennis pulls up to that spot. So yes, it does affect others. It affects all sorts of things, particularly if you if you, uh, you know, of what you want or what you're trying to manifest can only take place with a whole lot of people and things involved in it. You know, it's got a lot of structure. Well, that'll take more energy because you've, you've, you change things. But yes, that's, that does work that way. You do affect other people, not by forcing them to do something, but by just making it easier for them to do it this way rather than that way. And you know, that works. You know, that that basically is is a field. You know, I'm talking about all these gradients that kind of help you slide one way or another. Well, you know, that happens all the time. You know, when there's a when there's a crowd forming and the the uh the police come in and say, all right, everybody disperse. You know, everybody has to leave now. Well, that increases the gradient for people leaving. <laughs> people start thinking about leaving when they get that. And it's not just that they intellectually get the words that it's time to leave now. And it's an, an intellectual process at an intuitive level. 
they're also getting that thought that sticking around may not be such a good idea. You know, this maybe there's going to be some violence here or something else that I really don't want to get involved in. So they pick that up on an intuitive level. And on that intuitive level, people then start to walk off. Not just because they intellectually process the words and are obedient, but because they've got this sense of maybe it would be a good thing to do to go elsewhere. And if you think, you know, you think of how words and things affect how people think, you know, if, uh, or even the weather, you know, when it's been raining for three days, you know, it changes people's mindsets, it changes their, their moods, it changes how they approach life, you know, as opposed to whether it's a sunny day or so on. So there's just lots of things happen in our environment. One of the things that is really creating a lot of problems now in our, in our culture and in the world in general is that there's so much fear in the world, so much fear out there. And because there's so much fear out there, guess what? It's easier for us to be fearful because there's so much fear out there. You know, that's the, that's the collective consciousness connection. And in a collective consciousness, you affect it a little because you're just one person among a large collective, but it affects you more because you're just, you know, you're a member of that collective consciousness. So yes, we are affected by other people's thoughts. You know, it, it comes to mind that uh, some years ago I was reading about uh, you know all the people that worked at IBM. You know, and they all had to wear blue shirts and this and that and the other. And people would come in and they wouldn't buy into that. They'd be wearing their white shirt and their khaki pants or whatever. But you know, six months later, a year later, and they're still working there. Guess what? They started to wear blue shirts because everybody else did. You know, so what other people think affects your mind and affects how you think and affects the choices you make. So it's not that there's determinism out there and that, that Dennis is somehow forcing people to give him a parking space. He's just changing the probability such that it's more likely that all of that random stuff out there will end up with him having a parking space. And that does affect other people. Uh, thank you, Tom. That's uh, the it was, it was what I was thinking. I think that just to clarify one point, if I may, uh, is the the ability to influence somebody else's choices correlated to the level of what I would call them not having a, a strong grip on their own reins? Yeah, as a um, break. Yes, of course. Yeah. Of course, people. And again, it, it goes back to randomness. People who don't have a strong grip in their own reins tend to be more random in what they do. You know, they do things on, on very slight whims or they just happen to feel a little this way or that way. And it could be this way or that way. It's about equal. You know, they, they could go any of four or five different ways because they don't have a tight grip on the reins. They're not focused on where they're going and what they're doing and how they're going to get there. So they have a lot of uncertainty in their choices. And where they have a lot of uncertainty in their choices, well, those probabilities of what choices they'll make will shift a little bit. You know, that they'll they'll be influenced by that collective consciousness to to do one thing or another. So yes, the people who are more or less unaware and unconnected, particularly the people going through life as zombies, you know, who aren't really focused on anything, just kind of drifting through life, those people are very easily manipulated by yeah, by others, those who are very focused, it takes a lot more effort to manipulate them because their free will says, nope, I'm going here and I'm doing that. And to try to get them to go anyplace else or do anything else is not easy. You'd have to change a whole lot of probability to get them to see it some other way. Whereas if somebody's got a lot of uncertainty in their choices, you don't have to change much. You just change it a little bit and they'll kind of like a gradient, you know, they'll kind of slide off in that direction. Gotcha. My yeah, final, so, sorry, final clarifying point on that, if I may. Um, if you're seeking help from the LCS over and above just the level of probability, uh, one would imagine that that would tie into the nature of the outcome you're trying to manifest, whether it serves the greater good or whether it doesn't. Because exactly. 
manipulate versus influence, should I say. One being more sort of contributing, one more egocentric. So that, that was just also a little clarification. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, when you can, and we're talking about the nature of consciousness and how consciousness, how consciousness communicate with each other, basically, how they connect collective consciousness, how we are persuaded or, or uh, you know, in a, in a field of energy that's kind of nudging us this way and nudging us that way, you know, that's, that's can be used for good or for bad. You can have people manipulate others just to get their money, you know, to, to rip them off. And that's a very bad thing. It's a high entropy thing. And you can have other people uh, uh, helping change other people by just giving them a more positive viewpoint. Well, that's a good thing. And if you're asking the LCS for, uh, for help, then it needs to be toward a low entropy outcome where the LCS isn't going to be interested in giving you any help. But without the LCS being involved, you can use your intent for good or for evil to help or to hurt. You can not only heal people with your mind, you can hurt people with your mind. It's just the nature of consciousness. It's, it's, it's the way consciousness works and how it interacts. And yes, if you are, if, if you do have a, a trip, a tight grip on the reins, as you say, and you are aware and you are focused, then it makes it very difficult for anybody to make you ill with their mind. You see, that gives you protection because you're aware, you're alert, you have focus, you have purpose, and that lowers your uncertainty. You're not just uncertain, not just a cork bobbing around on an ocean going this way or that. You have direction. And now you're very hard to manipulate because of that. Thank you, Tom. Very, very helpful. Appreciate it. All right, Tom, this actually ties us in nicely to another question by Linda R. <coughs> about um, we don't necessarily have to participate in any of these paranormal activities, whether they be healing, changing the future probability, bending the rule set, exploring non-physical. It's not a requirement to do any of these things to grow up and become love. Isn't that right? That is correct. All you have to do to grow up is just become aware, get rid of your fears, which will get rid of your ego and get rid of your beliefs, and that's it. And any way that you can manage to do that is perfectly acceptable. You know, the paranormal is not a requirement to do. You know, understanding the theory, you know, understanding uh, MBT or the theory of MBT or that, you know, we are consciousness, consciousness is an information system. We're getting data streams in a virtual reality. If you don't understand any of that and couldn't care less, that won't stop you from growing. You can grow just fine. You know, all of that is beside the point. The point is make your best choices. It's how you grow up. You make the best choice you can and you make those choices with thought thinking about the choice. What is the low entropy choice? And after you've thought about it, you make it, and then you learn from the consequences of that choice. And then you make another choice, and you keep trying to make your choices better and better. So that's growing up. And if you do that, you don't ever have to meditate. <laughs> you don't ever have to do anything paranormal. You uh, just have to do that. That's, that's all. You know, growing up is getting rid of fear. And however you do that, that's going to make you grow up. So people like to play with the paranormal because that exercises their intuitive side. That requires their intellectual side to sit down and be quiet and just let them experience. And that is very helpful in seeing bigger pictures. Because once your intuitive side opens up, you realize that you're just a very small speck in a very big system. And that brings on some humility and some, some uh, understanding of bigger pictures and how you fit in and so on. So 
doing the paranormal things is often an exercise to help you develop that intuitive side at the being, you know, help develop that awareness at the being level. And that's all. So once you use those tools, say learning how to do paranormal things, after you use those tools and you grow up, you generally don't use them. You don't do anything paranormal. You don't want to, you know, you don't, there's no point in it. It was just a tool you used to develop your intuitive being level, your awareness at the being level. So some people take a path through the paranormal to develop themselves spiritually, but it's totally unnecessary. There are other tools that uh, may work better for some people. You know, tools are a personal preference, what tools you use. And if the paranormal just isn't that pretty little flower that just is, is enticing you to come learn and come experience, that's all right. It's, it's not really important at all. Um, just be, be authentic, be real, learn how to live in your intuitive side as well as your intellectual side. And then you'll, you'll begin to live in a bigger picture. It's just really, that sounds very simple. It's not necessarily that simple a thing to do. Changing yourself is a, it takes a lot of work, but yeah. Paranormal is no, no prerequisite to doing anything. All right, great. Um, Vanessa, I know Vanessa has a question for us. I don't see her here, but I think she's here and ready. Vanessa, are you here? Yes, I am here. Hi. Hey. Hey, hey. All right. Go ahead and ask your question. Thank you, Adam. Uh, hi, Tom. Nice to see you. Good to see you, Vanessa. Nice to see everybody. I'm really happy to be here. I love this community. It's so great to uh, to connect. And I miss everybody. I wish we could connect in person again and give hugs, but uh, one day, one day. <laughs> <laughs> um, so what's my question? Let's see. My question is, okay, I, Tom, I've heard you speak to psychedelics, uh, and I've heard you say that, no, they're not good. <laughs> or, I mean, generally, it's not... It can be a slippery slope because um, psychedelics basically blast you out and give you this experience. And oftentimes it's such an interesting experience that you then turn to psychedelics again and you kind of create this crutch with psychedelics. And so hearing you speak to psychedelics, I've, I've been um, avoiding them for the last like five to seven years since I've come across your work. Um, even though a lot of my friends explore with psychedelics. And so I keep hearing about it, but I'm like, no, 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 Tom says it's not good. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. Um, but uh, a few months ago, I ended up uh, exploring psychedelics and um, it really opened me up. And, and I think my intention for, for exploring psychedelics was that I've come to so many of um, so many different, you know, uh, immersives and like, out of body workshops and you know, my story is that I'm like, I got nothing. Like I never get out of body. I'm just sitting there and I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't see other realities or anything. And so for me, I'm like, okay, psychedelics, like I'll be able to explore other realities. But the thing is, I don't really get that either. So I, I get more intense experiences, but I don't. So it goes back to what you told me a long time ago was Vanessa, you have expectations and it's not you know, it's not working the way that you think it should. You're not blasted into a different reality. So therefore, um, you need to let go of your expectations. So I, I totally see that now, especially with psychedelics, because I'm still not getting what I'm hoping to get, which is like going to a new reality frame and interacting with different beings and entities. Like that never happens to me. So my question <laughs> then is, um, how does one just let go of expectations? Well, what you really have to let go of there, Vanessa, is your intellect. You you want to control your world with your intellect. You have this idea that you use your you use your intellect to make good choices. And if you make choices without your intellect, they are often bad choices. You know, you make choices because you're emotional or because you're upset, then 
those tend to be bad choices. But when you think about it and make choices with your intellect, they tend to be better choices. So life has kind of showed you that. And because of that, you want to make all of your choices through your intellect. Your expectations are things your intellect expects to happen, ways your intellect thinks that will happen. Those are also your beliefs. You know, your intellect and your beliefs are tied together, just like your intellect and your ego are tied together, just like your intellect and your fear are tied together. So because of your things you've read, people you've talked to, you know, you've heard other people talk about their experiences, and you want to have experiences like that. So when you have an experience like that, you'll feel like, ah, I've done it. I'm there. I had experience, just like what all the people are talking about. Mm -hmm. But you have to have your own experience. It won't be like other people's experience. It may be similar in some ways, but it's going to, it has to be your own. It has to be your own, and you have to just let it happen. It's nothing you can do. You can't make it happen. Well, I guess it can if you take those drugs. You took drugs and something happened, but evidently it really wasn't what you wanted to happen. It was something else happened. You no doubt got, you know, uh, your your awareness shifted when you took the drugs. You were no longer in the same mindset. Your reality probably shifted and all those things. But when you were done, you didn't really feel like you had gained anything terribly important. It was just a different experience. It wasn't something that really helped you grow up, which is the problem with drugs. You don't lower your entropy by taking a drug. It doesn't help you grow up any. Um, mostly the point of doing paranormal things like going out of body is because you're trying to grow up. So, you know, the drugs don't really help you grow up. They help you have an experience but you don't grow up because of an experience. You grow up because you change who you are, because you let go of fear. That's how you grow up. The only value that the paranormal has in it is that it expands your sense of what's possible. Now the possibility of getting rid of your fear maybe seems more reachable because your sense of the possibilities is bigger, but that's, you know, that's really not such a big advantage. You should be able to, you know, you'll be able to do all the things you want to do. It's just going to take you time until you stop trying to manage it. Stop trying to do it. Probably yeah. stop, stop trying even to want it. Just let it. <laughs> that's, just that's let. what I'm saying. Like, how do you just stop though? If it's something that you, and it's okay. So I did the, um, a few times the, the most powerful psychedelic, which is like five in the ODMT. And I would record myself doing, it. and it's guided and everything. So there's, you know, professionals who have been trained. Um, and when I looked at the recording after all I kept doing is going, let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go. And it, so, and every time I do it, I'm saying, let it go, let it go. And so I'm like, okay, hey, what's the lesson here? I need to, I'm trying to let go of what? And so what I hear you saying is let go of your intellect, let go of let go, let go of everything except you at the being level. You, okay? Let go of your intellect. Now, that doesn't mean get rid of your intellect. You need that intellect. The intellect is important. Yeah. But you need to be able to let it go when that's appropriate. Your intellect is limited in what it can do, what it can understand. It's a very limited tool. Your intuition is also limited but it can do things your intellect can't. So you want to let go of your limitations, basically. It's what you want to let go of, things that limit you. And you generally are limited by fears and ego and beliefs. So you already understand that these things can happen, that they're possible because you know a whole lot of people who have experienced them. So that's not your problem. But your problem is Probably, at a, at a deep level, Vanessa, you don't feel like you can really do this stuff. You think it maybe is beyond you, that you're inadequate to the task, 
that it's it's something that's going to be difficult for you. So that lack of of confidence, that lack of of uh, uh, what can I call it? Uh, that that being unsure of yourself. That's probably what gets you in your way more than anything else, because at a very deep level you don't really think all that highly of yourself and your capabilities. You have a, you have a sense of, I'm not really all that much. And you, that limits you. That so limits as, you. As I let go of my fear. So it's coming back to my fear of inadequacy again. Right. It always comes back to that. And it's so frustrating because I feel like I'm growing up and I'm shedding some of that inadequacy well, fear but obviously not enough. So what you're saying is once I let go of more fear of inadequacy, then I'll be able to go and explore out of body state. Yeah, and that'll just happen as you get older. <laughs> that'll just happen with time. Now you can make it happen more quickly by really having a, an intent to do that. You know, we talked about fear when we started this session, you know, just keeping that in your mind, you know, trying to get rid of the fears, just being who you are, accepting yourself as who you are. and. Uh, all of those things can help it go faster, but typically those things come with more experience. You're still young. You're still young, Vanessa. You still have a long time to go. <laughs> hey, Vanessa, I'm wondering, have you tried out Tom's Park yet? Yeah, I, I have. I have. Yeah, so that's, <laughs> that, that's one way that maybe will help you, but it's not a one-time thing. You have to use it over and over and over very consistently and your ability to work in the intuitive level will just grow with with experience in Tom's Park. So that's a good tool to use. But don't expect the first and second or third time that you know for miracles to happen. It's not like that. You have to do it enough so often that it becomes second nature. It becomes easy. And then it becomes easy to let the intellect go and just go on with your experience because you've done it so many times. Mm. So that's, that's a good place to start. Just let it happen. And when it starts to happen, don't say, oh, is it happening? Am I doing it? Because that makes it not happen. That just stops it cold in its tracks. Yeah, I've experienced just, that before. Yeah, you just have to have the experience. Let it flow. As it does, say I'm not going to judge this experience, whether it's, you know, smart or stupid or real or not real or whatever. I'm not going to judge it. I'm just going to have the experience and then have another experience and another experience. And by the time you're having your 20th or 30th or 50th experience, you'll find that the whole sense of it changes. Hmm. And it'll start to turn into something else. So... Okay. Yeah, Tom Spark would be a good way to to get past this uh, limitation that you put on yourself. Okay, thank you. I will. I will check out Tom. I'll see you all at Tom Spark then. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Tom.